Good evening. Welcome to week 33 of Plague Spear and Company. Tonight, we are pleased to bring you Shakespeare's first Henriad, which begins with tonight's reading of Henry VI, part one, and will continue over the next three weeks with Henry VI, parts two and three, and conclude with Richard III. These four plays cover the famous period of history known as the Wars of the Roses and include some of Shakespeare's greatest writing and over 250 characters. So, Grab your popcorn, tasty beverage, sit back, relax, and enjoy King Henry VI, part one. Hung be the heavens with black, yield day tonight. Comets importing change of times and states, brandish your crystal tresses in the sky, and with them scourge the bad revolting stars that have consented unto Henry's death. King Henry V, too famous to live long. England ne'er lost a king of so much worth. England ne'er had a king until his time. Virtue he had, deserving to command. His brandished sword did blind men with his beams. His arms spread wider than a dragon's wings. His sparkling eyes replete with wrathful fire. More dazzled and drove past his enemies than midday sun fierce bent against their faces. What should I say? His deeds exceed all speech. He ne'er lift up his hand, but conquered. We mourn in black. Why mourn we not in blood? Henry is dead and never shall revive. Upon a wooden coffin we attend, and death's dishonorable victory we with our stately presence glorify, like captives bound to a triumphant car. What? Shall we curse the planets of mishap that plotted thus our glory's overthrow? Or shall we think the subtle-witted French conjurers and sorcerers that, afraid of him by magic verses, have contrived his end? He was a king blessed of the king of kings. Unto the French the dreadful judgment day so dreadful will not be, as was his sight. The battles of the Lord of hosts he fought. The church's prayers made him so prosperous. The church! Where is it? Had not churchmen prayed, his threat of life had not soon decayed. None do you like but an effeminate prince, whom like a schoolboy you may overawe. Gloucester, whate'er we like, thou art protector, and lookest to command the prince and realm. Thy wife is proud, she holdeth thee in awe, more than God or religious churchmen may. <laughs> Name not religion, for thou lovest the flesh. And ne'er throughout the year to church thou goest, except it be to pray against thy foes. Cease. Cease these jars and rest your minds in peace. Let's see the altar. Heralds wait on us. Instead of gold, we'll offer up our arms, since arms avail not now that Henry's dead. Pros pros posterity await for wretched years. When all their mother's moistened eyes, babes shall suck, our isles be made a nourish of salt tears, and none but women left to wail the dead. Henry the Fifth, thy ghost I invocate. Prosper thus realm, keep it from civil broils. Combat with adverse planets the heavens. A far more glorious sky the soul will make than Julius Caesar or bright. My honorable lords. Health to all. Sad tidings bring I you out of France of loss, of slaughter and discomfiture. Guyenne, Champagne, Rheim, Orléans, Paris, Guisor, Poitiers are all quite lost. What sayest thou, man, before dead Henry's course? Speak softly, or loss of thy great towns will make him burst his lead and rise from the dead. 
Is Paris lost? Is Roan yielded up? If Henry were recalled to life again, these news would cause him once more yield the ghost. How were they lost? What treachery was used? No treachery, but want of men and money. Amongst the soldiers, this is muttered that here you maintain several factions and whilst a field should be dispatched and fought, you are disputing of your generals. One would have lingering wars with little cost, another would fly swift, but with wanted wings, a third thinks without expense at all. By guileful fail, fair words, peace may be obtained. Awake, awake English nobility, let not sloth dim your honors new begot. Cropped are the flower de luce in your arms. Of England's coat, one half is cut away. Were our tears wanting to this funeral, these tidings would call forth her flowing tides. Me they concerned. Regent, I am of France. Give me my steel co co coat. I'll fight for France. Away with these disgraceful wailing robes. Wounds will I lend the French instead of eyes to weep their intermissive miseries. Lords, view these letters full of bad mischance. France is revolted from the English quite, except some petty towns of no import. The Dauphin, Charles, is crowned king in Reims. The bastard of Orleans with him is joined. Rainier, Duke of Anjou, doth take his part. The Duke of Alenson flieth to his side. The Dauphin crowned king? All fly to him? Oh, whither shall we fly from this reproach? We will not fly but to our enemy's throats. Bedford? If thou be slack, I'll fight it out. Gloucester, why doubt thou my forwardness? A an army have I mustered in my thoughts, wherewith already France is overrun. My gracious lords, to add to your laments wherein you with now the Duke King's Henry's hairs, I must inform you of a dismal fight betwixt the stout Lord Talbot and the French. What, wherein Talbot overcame, is it so? Oh, no. Wherein Lord Talbot was ere thrown the circumstances, I tell you more at large. The 10th of August last, this dreadful lord retiring the siege of Orleans, having full scarce 6,000 in his troop by three and 20,000 upon the French, was round and compassed and set upon no leisure once he hadn't cranked his men. He wanted pikes to set before his archers, and said where in the sharp stakes plucked out the hedges, they picked up the ground confusedly to keep the horsemen off from breaking in. More than three hours, the fight continued. The valiant Albert upon his human thought enacted wonders with his sword and lance. Hundred is into hell. And understand him here, there, and everywhere, rage he slew. The French exclaimed, the devil was in arms. All the army stood gazed on him, his soldiers spying the undaunted spirit. A Talbot, a Talbot, crying out amain, and rushed to the bowels of the battle. And the consequence fully been sealed up. If Sir John Falstaff had not played the coward, he, being in the favored, paced him behind with purpose relief and followed them, cowardly fled, for not having struck one stroke, hence grew the general wreck and massacre. Enclosed were there their enemies, a base wall, and to win the Dauphin's grace. Thus Talbot with a spear in hand, whom all of France with the chief assembled strength does not presume to one look in the face. Is Talbot slain then? I will slay myself for living idly here in Pompanese, while such a worthy leader, leader wanting aid unto his dastard foeman is betrayed. Oh no, he lives, but is took prisoner, and Lord Scales with him and Lord Hungerford, most of this less slaughtered, and took likewise. His ransom there is none but I shall pay. I'll hail the Dauphin headlong from his throne. His crown shall be the ransom of my friend. Four of their lords I'll change for one of ours. Farewell, my maskers. To my task will I. Bonfires in France forthwith I am to make to keep our great St. George's feast withal. 10,000 soldiers with me I will take whose bloody deeds shall make all Europe quake. So had you need for Orleans is besieged. The English army is grown weak and faint. Those of Salisbury craveth supply and hardly keep his men from mutiny, since they so few watch such a multitude. 
Remember, lords, your oaths to Henry sworn, either to quell the Dauphin utterly or bring him in obedience to your yoke. I do remember it. And here, take my leave to go make about my preparations. All to the tower with all haste I can to view the artillery munition. And then I will proclaim young Henry king. To Altum will I, where the young king is, being ordained his special governor, and for his safety there I'll best devise. Each hath his place and function to attend. I am left out, for me nothing remains. But long I will not be jack out of office. The king from Eltham I intend to steal and sit at chiefest stern of public wheel. Mars, his true moving. Even as in the heavens, so in the earth to this day is not known. Late did he shine upon the English side. Now we are the victors. Upon us he smiles. What towns of any moment but we have. At pleasure here we lie near Orléans. Otherwise the famished English, like pale ghosts, faintly besiege us one hour in a month. They want their porridge and their fat bull beeves. Either they must be dieted like mules and have their provender tied to their mouths, or videos they will look like drowned mice. Let's raise the siege. Why live we idly here? Talbot is taken, whom we want to fear. Remaineth none but mad-brained Salisbury, and he may well in fretting spend his gall, nor men nor money happy to make war. Sound! Sound alarm! We will rush on them! Now, for the honor of the forlorn French, him I forgive my death that killeth me when he sees me go back one foot or fly! Who ever saw the like? What men have I? Dogs, cowards, dastards. I would ne'er have fled, but that they left me midst my enemies. Salisbury is a desperate homicide. He fighteth as one weary of his life. The other lords, like Lions wanting food do rush upon us as their hungry prey. Uh, uh, Frosser, the countryman of ours, records England all Oliver's and Roland's bread during the time of Edward III did reign. More truly, now may this be verified, for none but Samson's and Goliath's it send forth to skirmish. One to ten lean boned rascals who would e'er suppose they had such courage and audacity. Let's leave this town, for they are harebrained slaves, and hunger will enforce them to be more eager. Of old I know them, rather with their teeth the walls they'll tear down than forsake the siege. I think by some odd givers or device their arms are set, like clocks still to strike on, else there could they hold out as they do. By my consent, we'll even let them alone. Be it so. Where's the Prince Dauphin? I have news for him. Bastard of Orléans, thrice welcome to us. <sighs> Methinks you looks are sad, your cheer appalled. Hath the late overthrow wrought this offense? Be not dismayed, for succor is at hand. A holy maid hither with me I bring, which by a vision sent to her from heaven, ordained is to raise this tedious siege and drive the English forth the bounds of France. The spirit of deep prophecy she hath, exceeding the nine sibyls of old Rome. What's past and what's to come, she can descry. Speak, shall I call her in? Oh, believe my words, for they are certain and unfallible. Go call her in, but first, to try her skill. Renier, stand thou as Dauphin in my place. Question her proudly. Let thy looks be stern. By this means shall we sound what skill she hath. 
Fair maid, is thou will do these wondrous feats? Rainier, is thou that thinkst to beguile me? Where is the Dauphin? Come, come from behind. I know thee well, though never seen before. Be not amazed. There's nothing hid from me. In private will I talk with thee apart. Stand back, you lords, and give us leave a while. She takes upon her bravely at first dash. Dauphin, I am by birth a shepherd's daughter, my wit untrained in any kind of art. Heaven and Our Lady gracious hath it pleased to shine on my contemptible estate. Lo, whilst I waited on my tender lambs and to sun's parching heat displayed on my cheeks, God's mother deigned to appear to me and in a vision full of majesty willed me to leave my base vocation and free my country from calamity. Her aid she promised and assured success. In complete glory she revealed herself, and whereas I was black and swart before with those clear rays which she infused on me, that beauty am I blessed with which you may see. Ask me what question thou canst possible, and I will answer unpremeditated, my courage try by combat, if thou darest, and thou shalt find that I exceed my sex. Resolve on this, thou shalt be fortunate if thou receive me for thy warlike mate. Thou hast astonished me with thy high terms. <clears throat> Only this proof I'll, of thy valor make. In single combat thou shalt buckle with me, and if thou vanquishest, thy words are true. Otherwise, I renounce all confidence. I am prepared. Here is my keen-edged sword, decked with five flower de luces on each side, the which at terrain in St. Catherine's churchyard out of a great deal of old iron I chose forth. Then, God, in God's name, I fear no woman. And while I live, I'll ne'er fly from a man. <sighs> Say, say thy hands, thou art an Amazon, and fightest with the sword of Deborah. Christ's mother helps me, else I were too weak. Whoe'er helps thee, tis thou that must help me. Impatiently I burn with thy desire. My heart and hands thou hast at once subdued, excellent Pucelle. If thy name be so, let me thy servant and not sovereign be. Tis the French Dauphin sueth to thee thus. I must not yield to any rights of love, for my profession's sacred from above. When I have chased all thy foes from hence, then will I think upon a recompense. Meantime, look gracious on thy prostrate thrall. My lord, methinks tis very long in talk. Doubtless he shrives this woman to her smock, else ne'er could he so long protract his speech. Shall we disturb him since he keeps no mean? Mm, he may mean more than we poor men do now. These women are shrewd tempters with their tongues. My lord, where are you? What device you on? Shall we give our, our Orleans or no? Why no, I say. Distrustful recreants, fight till the last gasp. I'll be your guard. What she says, I'll confirm. We'll fight it out. Signed am I to be the English scourge. This night the siege assuredly I'll raise. Expect St. Martin's summer halcyon's days since I have entered into these wars. Glory is like a circle in the water which never ceaseth to enlarge itself till by broad spreading it disperse to naught. With Henry's death, the English circle ends. Dispersed are the glories it included. Now am I like that proud, insulting ship which Caesar and his fortune bear at once. Was Mohammed inspired with a dove? Thou, with an eagle, art inspired then. Helen, the mother of great Constantine, nor yet St. Philip's daughters were like thee. Bright star of Venus, fallen down on the earth, how may I reverently worship thee enough? Leave off delays, and let us raise the siege. Woman, do what thou canst to save our honors. Drive them from Orleans, and be immortalized. Presently, we'll try. Come, let's away about it. No prophet will I trust if she prove false. 
I am come to survey the tower this day. Since Henry's death, I fear there is conveyance. Where be these warders that they'd not wait here? Open the gates. Tis Gloucester that calls. Who's there that knocks so imperiously? It is the noble Duke of Gloucester. Who are he? You may not be let in. Villains, answer you, so the Lord Protector. The Lord protect him, so we answer him. We do no otherwise than we are willed. Who willed you? Or whose will stands but mine? There's none protector of the realm but I. Break up the gates. I'll be your warrant. I shall I be flouted by thus dunghill grooms. What noise is this? What traitors have we here? Lieutenant, is it you whose voice I hear? Open the gates. Here's Gloucester that would enter. Have patience, noble duke. I may not open. The Cardinal of Winchester forbids. From him I have expressed commandment that thou nor none of thine shall be let in. Faint-hearted Woodville prizes him before me. Arrogant Winchester, that haughty prelate, whom Henry, our late sovereign, ne'er could brook. Thou art no friend to God or the king. Open the gates or I'll shut thee out shortly. Open the gates unto the Lord Protector or we'll burst them open if you come not quickly. How now, ambitious Humphrey, what means this? Peel priest, dost thou command me to be shut out? I do, thou most usurping prodigal, and not protector of the king or realm. Stand back, thou manifest conspirator. Thou hast contrivest to murder our dead lord. Thou that givest whores indulgences to sin. I'll canvas thee in thy broad cardinal's hat, if thou proceed in thy insolence. Nay, stand thou back. I will not budge a foot. This be Damascus. Be thou cursed Cain, to slay thy brother Abel, if thou wilt. I will not slay thee, but I'll drive thee back. Thy scarlet robes as a child's bearing cloth I'll use to carry thee out of this place. Do what thou darest. I beard thee to thy face. What? Am I dared, dared and bearded to my face? Draw, men, for all this privileged place, blue coats to tawny coats, priest. Beware your beard. I mean to tug it and to cuff you soundly. Under my feet I shall stamp thy cardinal's hat. In spite of pope or dignities of church, here by the cheeks I'll drag thee up and down. Gloucester, thou wilt answer this before the pope. Winchester goose, I cry, a rope, a rope! Now beat them hence. Why do you let them stay? Thee I'll chase hence, thou wolf in sheep's array. Oh, tawny coats, out scarlet hypocrite! Hi, lords. That you being supreme majesties thus continuously should break the peace. Peace, Mayor, thou knowest little of my wrongs. Here's Buford that regards nor God nor king hath here distrained the towers to his use. Here's Gloucester, a foe to citizens, one that still motions war and never peace, or ever charging your free purses with large fines, that seeks to overthrow religion because he is protector of the realm and would have armor here out of the tower to crown himself king and suppress the prince. I will not answer thee with words, but blows. Not rest for me in this tumultuous strife, but to make open proclamation. Come, officer, as loud as e'er thou canst cry. All manner of men assembled here in arms this day against God's peace and the king's. We charge and command you in his highness name to repair to your several dwelling places and not to wear, handle, or use any sword, weapon, or dagger henceforth upon pain of death. 
Cardinal, I'll be no breaker of the law, but we shall meet and break our minds at large. Foster, we'll meet to thy cost, be sure. Thy hot blood I will have for this day's work. I'll call for clubs if you will not away. This cardinal's more haughty than the devil. Mayor, farewell. Thou dost, but thou mayest. Abominable Gloucester, guard thy head, for I intend to have ere long. See the coast cleared, and then we will depart. Good God, these noble stomachs bear. I myself fight not once in 40 years. Sirrah, thou knowest how Orleans is besieged and how the English have the suburbs won. Father, I know, and oft have shot at them. However unfortunate, I missed my aim. But now thou shalt not. Be thou ruled by me. Chief Master Gunner am I of this town. Something I must do to procure me grace. The prince's espials have informed me how the English and the suburbs close entrenched won't through a secret grate of iron bars in yonder tower to overpeer the city, and thence discover how with most advantage they may vex us with shot or with assault to intercept this inconvenience. A piece of ordnance against it I have placed, and even these three days have I watched if I could see them. Now do thou watch, for I can stay no longer. If thou spiest any, run and bring me word. Thou shalt find me at the governor's. Father, I warrant you, take no care, take you no care. I'll never trouble you if I may spy them. Talbot, my life, my joy again returned. How wert thou handled being prisoner? Hmm? Or by what means got thou to be released? Discourse, I prithee, on this turret's top. The Earl of Bedford had a prisoner called the brave Lord Ponton de Centrelle. For him was I exchanged and ransomed. But with a baser man of arms by far, once in contempt, they would have bartered me, which I, disdaining, scorned, and craved death rather than I would be so pilled esteemed. In fine, redeemed I was as I desired, but oh, the treacherous Falstaff wounds my heart, whom with my bare fist I would execute if I now had him brought into my power. Yet tellst thou not how thou wert entertained. With scoffs and scorns and contumulous taunts, in open marketplace produced they me to be a public spectacle to all. Here, they said, is the terror of the French the scarecrow that affrights our children so. Then broke I from the officers that led me and with my nails digged stones out of the ground to hurl at the beholders of my shame. My grisly countenance made others fly. None durst come near for fear of sudden death. In iron walls they deemed me not secure. So great fear of my name, amongst them were spread that they supposed I could rend bars of steel and spurn in pieces posts of adamant. Wherefore a guard of chosen shot I had that walked about me every minute while. And if I did but stir out of my bed, ready they were to shoot me to the heart. I grieve to hear what torments you endured, but we will be revenged sufficiently. Now it is supper time in Orléans. Here, through this grate, I count each one and view the Frenchmen how they fortify. Let us look in. The sight will much delight thee. Sir Thomas Margrave and Sir Thomas Glansdale. Let me have your express opinions. Where is best place to make our battery next? I think at the north gate, for there stands lords. And I here at the bulwark of the bridge. For aught I see, this city must be famished or with light skirmishes enfeebled. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy on us, wretched sinners. Oh, oh, Lord, have mercy on me, woeful man. What chance is this that suddenly hath crossed us? Speak, Salisbury. At least if thou canst, speak. How farst thou mirror of all martial men? 
one of thy eyes and thy cheek side struck off. A cursed tower, a cursed fatal hand that hath contrived this woeful tragedy. In 13 battles, Salisbury overcame. Henry V, he first trained to the wars. Whilst any trump did sound or drum struck up, his sword did ne'er leave striking in the field. Yet lifts thou, Salisbury, though thy speech doth fail, one eye thou hast to look to heaven for grace. The sun with one eye vieweth all the world. Heaven, be thou gracious to none alive if Salisbury wants mercy at thy hands. Bear hence his body. I will help bury it. Sir Thomas Gargrave, hast thou any life? Speak unto Talbot, nay, look up to him. Salisbury, cheer thy spirit with this comfort. Thou shalt not die whilst... Oh, he beckons his hand and smiles on me, as who should say, when I am dead and gone, remember to avenge me on the French. <clears throat> Plantagenet, I will. And like thee, Nero, play on the lute, beholding the towns burn. Wretched shall France be only in my name. What's <laughs> What stir is this? What tumults in the heavens? Whence cometh that alarm and the noise? My lord, my lord, the French have gathered head, the Dauphin with one Joan de Pacelle joined, a holy prophet new risen up, is come with great power to raise the siege. <laughs> Here, here, how dying Salisbury doth groan. It irks his heart. He cannot be revenged. Frenchman, I'll be a Salisbury to you. Pacelle or puzzle, dolphin or dogfish. Your hearts I'll stamp out with my horse's heels and make a quagmire of your mingled brains. Convey me Salisbury into his tent and then we'll try what these dastard Frenchmen dare. Where is my strength, my valor, and my force? Our English troops retire, I cannot stay them. A woman clad in armor chaseth them. Oh, here, here she comes. Oh, I'll have a bout with thee, devil or devil's dam. I'll conjure thee, blood will I draw on thee. Thou art a witch, and straightway give thy soul to him thou serfst. Come, come, tis only I that must disgrace thee. Uh, 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 heavens, can you suffer hell to prevail? My breast I'll burst with straining of my courage and from my shoulders crack my arms asunder, but I will chastise this high-minded strumpet. Talbot, farewell. Thy hour is not yet come. I must go victual Orleans forthwith. Or take me if thou canst, I scorn thy strength. Go, go, cheer up thy hungry, starved men. Help Salisbury to make his testament. This day is ours, as many more shall be. Oh, my thoughts are whirled like a potter's wheel. I know not where I am, nor what I do. A witch by fear, not force, like Hannibal, drives back our troops and conquers as she lists. So bees with smoke and doves with noisome stench are from their hives and houses driven away. They called us for our fierceness English dogs now, like to whelps, we cry and run away. Our countrymen, either renew the fight or tear the lions out of their, your English coats. Renounce your soil, give sheep in lion stead. Sheep run not half so treacherous from the wolf or horse or oxen from the leopard as you fly from your off-subdued slaves. <laughs> it will not be. Retire into your trenches. You all consented unto Salisbury's death, for none would strike a stroke in his revenge. Pucelle is entered into Orleans in spite of us or aught what we could do. Oh, would I were to die with Salisbury. The shame hereof will make me hide my head. Oh, 
Advance our waving colors on the walls, rescued as Orleans from the English. Thus, Joan de Pucelle hath performed her word. Divinest creature, Astrea's daughter, how shall I honor thee for the success? Thy promises are like Adonis' garden, that one day bloomed and fruitful were the next. France, triumph in thy glorious prophetess. Recovered is the town of Orléans. More blessed hap did ne'er before all state. Why, ring not out the bells aloud throughout the town, Dauphin. Command the citizens make bonfires and feast the banquet in the open streets to celebrate the joy that God hath given us. <laughs> All France will be replete with mirth and joy when they shall hear how we have played the men. Tis Joan, not we, by whom the day is won, for which I will divide my crown with her. And all the priests and friars in my realm shall in procession sing her endless praise. A statelier pyramus to her I'll rear than, than Rodopes of Memphis ever was. In memory of her when she is dead, her ashes in an urn more precious than the rich jeweled coffer of Darius transported shall be at high festivals before the kings and queens of France. No longer on Saint Denis will we cry, but Joan de Passel shall be France's saint. Come in and let us banquet royally after this golden day of victory. Sirs, take your places and be vigilant. If any noise or soldier you perceive near the walls, by some apparent sign, let us have knowledge at the court of the guard. Sergeant, you shall. Thus, our poor servitors more when others sleep upon their quiet beds, constrained to watch in darkness, rain and cold. Lord Regent and redoubted Burgundy, by whose approach the regions of Artois, Wallen and Picardy are friends to us, this happy night, the Frenchmen are secure. <clears throat> All day caroused and banqueted. Embrace we then this opportunity as fitting best to quittance their deceit contrived by art and baleful sorcery. Coward of France, how much he wrongs his fame despairing of his own arms fortitude to join with witches in the help of hell. Traitors have never other company. But what's that Pucelle whom they term so pure? The maid, they say. The maid? And be so martial? I uh, pray God she prove not masculine ere long. If underneath the standard of the French she carry armor as she hath begun. Well, let them practice and converse with spirits. God is our fortress in whose conquering name let us resolve to scale their flinty bulwarks. Ascend, brave Talbot, we will follow thee. Mm -mm -mm, not altogether. Better far, I guess, that we do make our entrance several ways, that if it chance the one of us do fail, the other yet may rise against their force. Agreed. I'll to yon corner. Good night to hear this. And here will Talbot mount or make his grave. Now, Salisbury, for thee, and for the right of English Henry, shall this knight appear how much in duty I am bound to both. St. George! A Talbot! No. A Talbot! On! On! The enemy doth make assault! Uh, how, 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 how now, my lord? What, what all? So, so uh, unready, so? Unready? I am glad we escaped so well. Oh, it was time, I trow, to wake and leave our beds, hearing alarums at our chamber doors. Of all exploits since first I followed arms, ne'er heard I have a, a, a warlike enterprise more venturous or desperate than this. I think this Talbot be a fiend of hell. If not of hell, the heavens true favor him. Ah, here cometh Charles. I marvel how he sped. Tut, holy Joan was his defensive guard. Is this thy cunning, thou deceitful dame? Didst thou at first to flatter us withal, make us partakers of a little gain, that now our loss might be ten times so much? Wherefore is Charles impatient with his friend? At all times will you have my power alike? 
Sleeping or waking, must I still prevail? Or will you blame and lay the fault on me? Improvident soldiers, had your watch been good, this sudden mischief could ne'er have fallen. Duke of Alençon, this was your default, that the uh, uh, captain of the watch tonight did look no better to that weighty charge. And had all of your quarters been as safely kept as that wherefore I had the government, we had not been thus shamefully surprised. <laughs> Mine was secure. And so was mine, my lord. And for myself, most part of all this night, within her quarter and mine own precinct, I was employed in passing to and fro about relieving of the sentinels. Then how or which way should they first break in? Question, my lords, no further of the case how or which way. To sure they found some place but weakly guarded where the breach was made. And now there rests no other shift but this, to gather our soldiers, scattered and dispersed, and lay new platforms to endamage them. Oh. A Talbot! A Talbot! I'll be so bold to take what we have left. The cry for Talbot serves me for a sword, for I have loaded me with many spoils, using no other weapon but his name. The day begins to break and night is fled, whose pitchy mantle or veiled the earth. Hear sound retreat and cease our hot pursuit. Oh. Bring forth the body of old Salisbury. And here, advancing in the marketplace, the middle center of this cursed town. Now have I <clears throat> bow unto his soul. For every drop of blood was drawn from him, there hath at least five Frenchmen died tonight. And that hereafter ages may behold what ruin happened in revenge of him within their chiefest temple, I'll erect a tomb, wherein his corpse shall be interred, upon the which that every one may read shall be engraved the sack of Orleans, the treacherous manner of his mournful death, and what a terror he had been to France. But lords, in all our bloody massacre, I muse, we met not with the Dauphin's grace, his new-come champion, virtuous Joan of Air, nor any of his false confederates. It's his thought, Lord Tab Talbot. When the fight began, roused on the sudden from their drowsy beds, they did amongst the troops of armed men leap o'er the walls for refuge in the fields. Myself, as far as I could well discern, for smoke and dusty vapors of the night, I'm sure I scared the Dauphin and his troll when arm in arm they both came swiftly running like a pair of loving turtle doves that could not live asunder day or night. After that, things are set in order here. We'll follow them with all the power we have. All the hail, my lords. Which of this uh, princely train call ye the warlike Talbot? For his acts is much applauded through the realm of France. Uh here is the Talbot. Who would speak with him? Uh, the virtuous lady, Countess of Avignon, with modesty admiring thy renown, by me entreats, great lord, thou wouldst vouchsafe to visit her poor castle where she lies, that she may boast she has beheld the man whose glory fills the world with loud report. Is it even so? <laughs> then I see our wars will turn into a peaceful comic sport when ladies crave to be encountered with. I mean, you may not, my lord, despise her gentle suit. Mm, there, trust me then. For when a world of men could not prevail with all their oratory, yet hath a woman's kindness o'erruled. And therefore, tell her I return great thanks and in submission will attend on her. Will not your honors bear me company? Uh, no, truly. Tis more than manners will. And I have heard it said, unbidden guests are often welcome when they are gone. Well then, alone, since there's no remedy, I mean to prove this lady's courtesy. Uh, come hither, Captain. I do, my lord, and mean accordingly. <laughs> Good, you do perceive my mind. I like this. Order. Remember what I gave in charge, and when you have done so, bring the keys to me. Madam, I will. The plot is laid. 
If all things fall out right, I shall be as famous by this exploit as Scythian Tomaris by Cyrus's death. Great is the rumor of this dreadful night, and his achievements of no less account. Fain would mine eyes be witness with mine ears to give their censure of these rare reports. And madam, according as your ladyship desired, by message crave, so is Lord Tablet come. And he is welcome. What? Is this the man? Uh, madam, it is. <laughs> is this the scourge of France? Is this the Talbot so much feared abroad that with his name the mothers still their babes? I see report is fabulous and false. I thought I should have seen some Hercules, a second Hector for his grim aspect and large proportion of his strong knit limbs. Alas, this is a child, a silly dwarf. It cannot be this weak and riddled shrimp should strike such terror to his enemies. Adam, I uh, have been bold to trouble you, but since your ladyship is not at leisure, I'll sort some other time to visit you. Well, what means he now? Go ask him whether he goes. Uh, stay, my lord Talbot, for my lady craves to know the cause of your abrupt departure. Well, marry, for that she's in a wrong belief. I go to certify her Talbots here. If thou be he, then thou art prisoner. A, pr a prisoner? To whom? To me, bloodthirsty lord. And for that cause I trained thee to my house. Long time thy shadow hath been thrall to me, for in my gallery thy picture hangs. But now... The substance shall endure the leg, and I will chain these legs and arms of thine that hast by tyranny these many years wasted our country, slain our citizens, and sent our sons and husbands captivate. Laughest <laughs> thou wretch? Thy mirth shall turn to moan. Oh, oh, I laugh to see your ladyship so fond to think that. You have aught but Talbot's shadow whereon to practice your severity. Why, art not thou the man? Oh, I am indeed. Then have I substance too. Oh, no, 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 I am but a shadow of myself. Uh, you are deceived. My substance is not here. For what you see is but the smallest part and least proportion of humanity, I tell you, madam. Were the whole frame here, it is of such a spacious, lofty pitch, your roof were not sufficient to contain it. Is a riddling merchant for the nonce. He will be here, and yet he is not here. How can these contrarities agree? Ah, that will I show you presently. Da, 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 da. Ah, how say you, madam? Are you now persuaded that Talbot is but a shadow of himself? These are his substance, sinews, arms, and strength with which he yoketh your rebellious necks, raiseth your cities, and subverts your towns, and in a moment makes them desolate. Victorious Talbot, pardon my abuse. I find thou art no less in fame, hath brooded, and more than may be gathered by thy shape. Let my presumption not provoke thy wrath, for I am sorry that with reverence I did not entertain thee as thou art. Ah, be not dismayed, fair lady, nor misconster the mind of Talbot, as you did make mistake the outward composition of his body. What you have done hath not offended me, nor other satisfaction do I crave, but only with your patience that we may taste your wine and see what cates you have, for soldier stomachs always serve them well. With all my heart, mm -hmm. I think me honored to feast so great a warrior in my house. Great lords and gentlemen, what means this silence? Dare no man answer in a case of truth. Within the temple hall, we were too loud. 
The garden here is more convenient. Then say at once if I maintained the truth, or else was wrangling Somerset in the error. Faith, I have been a truant in the law, and never yet could frame my will to it, and therefore frame the law unto my will. Judge you, my lord of Warwick, then between us. Between two hawks, which flies the higher pitch? Between two dogs, which hath the deeper mouth? Between two blades, which hath the better temper? Between two horses, which doth bear him best? Between two girls, which hath the merriest eye? I have perhaps some shallow spirit of judgment, but these nice sharp quillets of the law, good faith, I'm no wiser than a doll. Tut, tut, here is a mannerly forbearance. The truth appears so naked on my side that any purblind eye might find it out. And on my side, it is so well apparelled, so clear, so shining and so evident that it will glimmer through a blind man's eye. Since you are tongue-tied and so loath to speak, in dumb significance proclaim your thoughts. Let him, that is a true-born gentleman and stands upon the honor of his birth, if he suppose that I have pleaded truth, from off this briar pluck a white rose with me. Let him that is no coward nor flatterer, but dare maintain the party of the truth, pluck a red rose from off this thorn with me. I love no colors, and without all color of base insinuating flattery, I pluck this white rose with the plantagenet. I pluck this red rose with young Somerset, and say with all I think he held the right. Nay, lords and gentlemen, pluck no more, till you conclude that he upon whose side the fewest roses are cropped from the tree shall yield the other in the right opinion. Good, Master Vernon, it is well objected. If I have fewest, I subscribe in silence. And I. And then for the truth and plainness of the case, I pluck this pale maiden blossom here, giving my verdict on the white rose side. Prick not your finger as you pluck it off, lest bleeding you do paint the white rose red and fall on my side, so against your will. If I, my lord, for my opinion bleed, opinion shall be a surgeon to my heart, and keep you on the side where I still am. Well, well, come on, who's else? Unless my study and my books be false, the argument you held was wrong in you. In sign whereof, I pluck a white rose too. Now, Somerset, where is your argument? Here in my scabbard, meditating that shall dye your white rose in a bloody red. Meantime, your cheeks do counterfeit our roses, for pale they look with fear as witnessing the truth on our side. No, Plantagenet, tis not for fear, but anger, that thy cheeks blush for pure shame to counterfeit our roses. And yet thy tongue will not confess thy error. Hath not a rose, thy rose a canker, Somerset. Hath not thy rose a thorn, Plantagenet. Ay, sharp and piercing to maintain his truth, whilst thy consuming canker eats his falsehood. Well, I'll find friends to wear my bleeding roses that shall maintain what I have said is true, where false Plantagenet dare not be seen. Now by this maiden blossom in my hand, I scorn thee and thy fashion, peevish boy. Burn not thy scorns this way, Plantagenet. Proud pole, I will, and scorn both him and thee. I'll turn my part thereof into thy throat. Away, away, good William de la Pole. We grace the yeoman by conversing with him. Now by God's will, thou wrongst him, Somerset. His grandfather was Lionel, Duke of Clarence, third son of the third King Edward of England. Spring crestless yeoman from some so deep a root bears him on the place's privilege, or durst not for his craven heart say thus. 
By him that made me, I'll maintain my words on any plot of ground in Christendom. Was not thy father Richard, Earl of Cambridge, for treason executed in our king's late days? And by his treason stands not thou attainted, corrupted, and exempt from ancient gentry? His trespass yet lives guilty in thy blood. Until thou be restored, thou art a yeoman. My father was attached, not attainted, condemned to die for treason, but no traitor. And that I'll prove on better men than Somerset, were growing time once ripened to my will. For your partaker, Pole, and you yourself, I'll note you in my book of memory to scourge you for this apprehension. Look to it well. Say you were well warned. And thou shalt find us ready for thee still. And know us by these colors for thy foes, for these my friends in spite of thee shall wear. And by my soul this pale and angry rose, as cognizance of my blood-drinking hate, will I forever and my faction wear, until it wither with me to my grave, or flourish to the height of my degree. Go forward and be choked with thy ambition. And so farewell until I meet thee next. Have with thee, Paul. Farewell, ambitious Richard. How? I am braved and must perforce endure it. This, this blot that they object against your house shall be wiped in and out of the next parliament. And if thou called for the truth, called for the truce of Winchester and Gloucester, and if thou be not then created your, I will not then be accounted Warwick. Meantime, in signal of my love of thee, Against proud Somerset and William Pole will I upon thy party wear this rose. And here I prophesy this brawl today, grown to this faction in the temple garden, shall send between the red rose and the white a thousand souls to death and deadly night. Good Master Vernon, I am bound to you that you on my behalf would pluck a flower. In your behalf, sir, I will wear the same. And so will I. Thanks, gentlemen. Come, let's us four to dinner. I dare say this quarrel will drink blood another day. <laughs> kind keeper of my weak decaying age, let dying Mortimer here rest himself, even like a man who hailed from the wreck. So fair my limbs with long imprisonment. <laughs> and these gray locks, the perspace of death, Nestor, like age and age of care, argue the end of Edmund Mortimer. These eyes, like lamps whose wasting oil is spent, wax dim as drawing to their exigent. Weak shoulders all born with burdening grief and pitiless arms, like to a withered vine that droops as sapless branches to the ground. <laughs> Yet are these feet, whose strengthless stay is numb and unable to support this lump of clay, swift winged with desire to get a grave, as witting I no other comfort have. <sighs> but tell me, keeper. <coughs> Will my nephew come? Richard Plantagenet, my lord, will come. I sent him to the temple, unto his chamber, and answer was returned that he will come. Enough. My soul shall then be satisfied. Poor gentleman, his wrong doth equal mine. Since Henry Monmouth first began to reign before whose glory I was great in arms, this loathsome sequestration have I had. And even since then hath Richard been obscured, deprived of honor and inheritance. But now the arbiter of despair's just death, kind umpire of men's miseries, with sweet enlargements doth dismiss me hence. I would his troubles likewise were expired, that he might recover what was lost. My lord, your loving nephew is now come. Richard Plantagenet, my friend, is he come? Aye, noble uncle, uh, thus ignobly used. 
your nephew late despised Richard comes. Direct my arms, I, I may embrace his neck and in his bosom spend my letter gasp. Don't tell me when my lips do touch his cheeks that I may kindly give one fainting kiss. And now declare sweet stem from York's great stock. Why didst thou say of late thou wert despised? First, lean thine aged back against mine arm, and in that ease I'll tell thee my disease. This day, an argument upon a case, some words there grew twixt Somerset and me, among which terms he used his lavish tongue and did upbraid me with my father's death, which obloquy set bars before my tongue, else with the like had I requited him. Therefore, good uncle, for my father's sake, in honor of a true Plantagenet, and for alliance sake, declare the cause my father, Earl of Cambridge, lost his head. That cause, fair nephew, that imprisoned me and hath detained me all my flowering youth within the loathsome dungeon there to pine was cursed instrument of his decease. Discover more at large what cause that was, for I am ignorant and cannot guess. I will. If that my fading breath permit and death approach not ere my tale be done. Henry the Fourth, grandfather to this king, deposed his nephew Richard, Edward's son, the first begotten and the lawful heir of Edward's king, the third of that descent. During whose reign the Percy's of the North, finding his usurpation most unjust, endeavored my advancement to the throne. The reason, reason moved these warlike lords to this was for that young Richard thus removed, leaving no heir begotten of his body. I was next by birth and parentage, for by my mother I derived him from Lionel, Duke of Clarence, third son to King Edward III, whereas he from John of Gaunt doth bring his pedigree, being but fourth of that heroic line. But mark, as in this haughty great attempt, they labored to plant the rightful heir, I lost my liberty and they their lives. Long after this, when Henry V, succeeding his father Bolingbroke, did reign, thy father, Earl of Cranbridge, then the, derived from famous Edmund Langley, Duke of York, marrying my sister and thy mother was again in pity of my hard distress, levied an army, weaning to redeem and have installed me in the diadem. But as the rest, so fell the noble Earl and was beheaded. Thus the Mortimers in whom the title rested were suppressed. Of which my Lord, your honor is the last. True, and thou seest that I no issue have and that my fainting words do warrant death. Thou art my heir. The rest I wish thee gather, but yet be wary in thy studious care. Thy grave admonishments prevail with me, but yet methinks my father's execution was nothing less than bloody tyranny. With silence, nephew, be thou politic. Strong fixed is the house of Lancaster and like a mountain not to be removed. And now thy uncle is removing hence. As princes do their courts, when they are cloyed with long continuance in a settled place. Oh, uncle, would some part of my young years might but redeem the passage of your age. Thou dost then wrong me, as that slaughterer doth which giveth many wounds when one will kill. Mourn not. Except thou sorrow for my good, only give order for my funeral. And so, farewell. And fair be all thy hopes, and prosperous be thy life in peace and war. In peace, no war befall thy parting soul. In prison hast thou spent a pilgrimage, and like a hermit's overpassed thy days. Well, I will lock his counsel in my breast, and what I do imagine, let that rest. Keeper, convey him hence, 
and I myself will see his burial better than his life. Here dies the dusky torch of Mortimer, choked with ambition of the meaner sort. And for those wrongs, those bitter injuries which Somerset hath offered to my house, I doubt not but with honor to redress. And therefore haste I to the parliament, either to be restored to my blood or make my will the advantage of my good. Thomas thou with deep premeditated lines, with written pamphlets studiously devised, Humphrey of Gloucester, if thou canst accuse or aught intendest to lay unto my charge, do it without invention, suddenly, as I with sudden and extemporal speech purpose to answer what thou canst object. Presumptuous priest, this place commands my patience, or thou shouldst find thou hast dishonored me. Think not, although in writing I preferred the manner of thy vile, outrageous crimes that therefore I had forged, or am not able to verbatim to rehearse the method of my pen. No, prelate, such is thy audacious wickedness, thy lewd, preciferous, dissentious pranks, as very infants prattle of thy pride, thou art a most pernicious usurer. Forward by nature, enemy to peace, lascivious, wanton, more than well beseems a man of thy profession and degree. And for thy treachery, what's more manifest? In that thou layest a trap to take my life, as well as London Bridge is at the tower. Beside, I fear me, if thy thoughts were sifted, the king, thy sovereign, is not quite exempt from envious malice of thy sweltering heart. Gloucester, I do defy thee. Lords, vouchsafe to give me hearing what I shall reply. If I were covetous, ambitious, or or perverse, as he will have me, how am I so poor? Or how haps it I seek not to advance or raise myself, but keep my wanted calling? As for dissension... Who prefereth peace more than I do, except I be provoked? No, my good lords, it is not that offends. It is not that that hath incensed the duke. It is because no one should sway but he. No one but he should be about the king. And that engenders thunder in his breast. It makes him roar these accusations forth. But he shall know I am as good as... As good? Thou bastard of my grandfather! I, lordly sir, for what are you, I pray, but one imperious in another's throne? Am I not protector, saucy priest? And am I not a prelate of the church? Yes, as an outlaw in a castle keeps useth to in, to patronage of his theft. Unreverent Gloucester. <laughs> Thou art reverent, touching thy spiritual function, not thy life. Rome shall remedy this. Rome thither then. <laughs> My lord. It were your duty to forbear. Aye, so the bishop be not overborne. He thinks my lord should be religious and know the office that belongs to such. He thinks his lordship should be humbler. It fitteth not a prelate so to plead. Yes, when his holy state is touched so near. State holy or unhallowed? What of that? It's not his grace protector to the king. Antagonate, I see, must hold his tongue. Lest it be said, speak, Sirrah, when you should. Must your bold verdict enter talk with lords? Else would I have a fling at Winchester. Uncles of Gloucester and of Winchester, the special watchmen of our English wheel, I would prevail if prayers might prevail to join your hearts in love and amity. What a scandal it is to our crown that two such noble peers as ye should jar. Believe me, lords, my 
tender years can tell, civil dissension is a viperous worm that gnaws the bowels of the Commonwealth. What time is this? An uproar, I dare warrant, begun through malice of the bishop's men. Stones! Oh, stones! 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 Oh, my good lords and virtuous Henry, pity the city of London, pity us. The bishop and the Duke of Gloucester's men, forbidden late to carry any weapon, have filled their pockets full of pebble stones. And bending themselves in contrary parts, do pelt so fast at one another's pate that many have their giddy brains knocked out. Our windows are broke down in every street, and we, for fear, compelled to shut our shops. We charge you on allegiance to ourselves to hold your slaughtering hands and keep the peace. Pray, Uncle Gloucester, mitigate this strife. Hey, if we be forbidden stones, we'll fall to it with our teeth. Do what ye dare. We are as resolute. You of my household, leave this peevish broil and set this unaccustomed fight aside. My lord, we know your grace to be a man, just and upright, and for your royal birth inferior to none but to his majesty, and ere that we will suffer such upright a prince, so kind a father of the commonweal to be disgraced by an the inkhorn mate, we and our wives and children all will fight and have our bodies slaughtered by thy foes. I and the very parings of our nails shall pitch a field when we are dead. Stay, stay, I say! And if you love me as you say you do, let me persuade you to forbear a while. Oh, how this discord doth afflict my soul. Can you, my lord of Winchester, behold my sighs and tears and will not once relent? Who should be pitiful if you not be? Or who should study to prefer a peace if holy churchmen take delight in broils? Yield, my lord protector, yield, Winchester. Except you mean with obstinate repulse to slay your sovereign and destroy the realm. You see what mischief and what murder too hath been enacted through your enmity. Then be at peace. Except ye thirst for blood. He shall submit, or I will never yield. Compassion on the king commands me stoop, or I will see his heart out ere the priest should ever get that privilege of me. Behold, my lord of Winchester, the duke hath banished moody, discontented fury, and by his smoothed brows it doth appear why you look stern as so while you look so stern and tragical. Here, Winchester, I offer thee my hand. Fie, Uncle Beaufort, I have heard you preach that malice was a great and grievous sin, and will you not maintain the thing you teach but prove a chief offender in the same? Sweet King, the bishop hath a kindly gird. For shame, my lord of Winchester, relent. What, shall a child instruct you what to do? Well, Duke of Gloucester, I will yield to thee, love for thy love, and hand for hand I give. Aye, but I fear me with a hollow heart. See here. My friend and loving countryman, this token severeth for a flag of truth betwixt ourselves and all our followers. So help me God as I dissemble not. So help me God as I intended not. <laughs> oh, loving uncle, kind Duke of Gloucester, how joyful am I made by this contract. Away, my masters, trouble us no more, but join in friendship as your lords have done. Content, all to the surgeons. So will I. And I'll see what physic the tavern affords. Accept this scroll, most gracious sovereign, which in the right of Richard Plantagenet, 
we do exhibit to your majesty. Well urged, my lord of Warwick. For sweet prince, and if your grace mark everything, every circumstance, you have great reason to do Richard right, especially for those occasions at Eltham Place, I told your majesty. And those occasions, uncle, were of force. Therefore, my loving lords, our pleasure is that Richard be restored to his blood. Let Richard be restored to his blood. So shall his father's wrongs be recompensed. As will the rest, so willeth Winchester. If Richard will be true, not that alone, but all the whole inherited inheritance I give that doth belong unto the house of York, from whence you spring by lineal descent. Thy humble servant vows obedience and humble service till the point of death. Stupid then and set your knee against my foot. And in regarding of that duty done, I gird thee with the valiant sword of York. Rise, Richard, like a true Plantagenet, and rise created princely Duke of York. So thrive, Richard, as thy foes may fall. And as my duty springs, so perish they that grudge one thought against your majesty. Welcome, High Prince, the mighty Duke of York. Perish, base prince, ignoble Duke of York. Now will it best avail your majesty to cross the seas and to be crowned in France, the presence of a king engenders love amongst his subjects and his loyal friends, and it disanimates his enemies. When Gloucester says the word, King Henry goes. <laughs> For friendly counsel cuts off many foes. Your ship already are in readiness. Aye, we march in England or in France, not seeing what is likely to ensue. This late dissension grown betwixt the peers burns under feigned ashes of forged love and will at last break out into a flame as festered members rot, but by degree, till bones and flesh and sinews fall away, so will this base and envious discord breed. And now I fear that fatal prophecy which in the time of Henry named the fifth was in the mouth of every sucking babe, that Henry born at Monmouth should win all, and Henry born at Windsor lose all, which is so plain that Exeter doth wish his days may finish ere that hapless time. These are the city gates, the gates of Rome, through which our policy must make a breach. Take heed, be wary how you place your words, talk like the vulgar sort of market men that come to gather money for their corn. If we have entrance, as I hope we shall, and that we find the slothful watch but weak, I'll by a sign give notice to our friends that Charles the Dauphin may encounter them. Sacks shall be a mean to sack the city and we be lords and rulers all over Rome. Therefore, we'll knock. Quillain? Pesant, le pauvre Jean de France, poor market folks that come to sell their corn. Hmm. tow, go in. The market bill is wrong. Now, Rhone, I'll shake thy bulwarks to the ground. Saint Denis, bless this happy stratagem, and once again we'll sleep secure in Rouen. Here entered Purcell and her practicants. Now she is there. How will we? she specify here is the best and safe, safest passage in? By thrusting out a torch from yonder tower, which once discerned shows that her meaning is no way to that for weakness which she entered. <laughs> oh. 
Behold, this is the happy wedding torch that joineth Rowan unto her countrymen, but burning fatal to the Talbanites. See, noble Charles, the beacon of our friend, the burning torch in yonder turret stands. Now shine it like a comet of revenge, a prophet to the fall of all our foes. Defer no time, delays have dangerous ends. Enter and cry, the Dauphin presently, and then do execution on the watch. France, thou shalt rue this treason with thy tears, if Talbot but survive thy treachery. Pucelle, that witch, that damned sorceress, hath wrought this hellish mischief unawares that hardly we escape the pride of France. <laughs> Morrow, gallants, want ye corn for bread? I think the Duke of Burgundy will fast before he'll buy again at such a rate. Twas full of darnel. Do you like the taste? Scoff on, vile fiend and shameless courtesan. Trust ere long to choke thee with thine own and make thee curse the harvest of that corn. Your grace may starve, perhaps, before that time. Oh, let no words but these revenge this treason. What will you do, good Greybeard? Break a lance and run a tilt at death within a chair? Foul fiend of France and Hague of all despite, encompassed with thy lustful paramours! But comes it thee to taunt this valiant age and twit with cowardice a man half dead? Damsel, I'll have a bout with you again, or else let Talbot perish with his shame! Are ye so hot, sir? Yet, Purcell, hold thy peace. If Talbot do but thunder, rain will follow. Godspeed, the Parliament. Who shall be the speaker? Dare you come forth and meet us in the field? Belike your lordship takes us then for fools to try if that our own be ours or no. Oh, I speak not to that railing Hecate, but unto thee, Allinson, and the rest. Will ye, like soldiers, come and fight it out? Signor. No. Oh, Signor. Hang. Base muleters of France, like peasant footboys do they keep the walls and dare not take arms, like gentlemen. Away, captains. Let's get us from the walls, for Talbot means no goodness by his looks. God by, my lord. We came but to tell you that we are here. Oh, and there will we be too, ere it be long, or else reproach be Talbot's greatest fame. Thou, Burgundy, by honor of thy house, pricked on by public wrongs, sustained in France, either to get the town again or die. And I, as sure as English Henry lives, and as his father here was conqueror, as sure as in his late betrayed town, great Cor de Leon's heart was buried, so sure I swear to get the town or die. My vows are equal partners with thy vows. But here we go, regard this dying prince the valiant Duke of Bedford. Come, my lord, we will bestow you in some better place, fitter for sickness and for crazy age. <laughs> lord Talbot, do not so dishonor me. Here will I sit before the walls of Rowan and will be partner of your weal or woe. Courageous Bedford, let us now persuade you. No, not to be gone from hence. For once, I read that stout Pendragon in his litter stick came to the field and vanquished his foes. Methinks I should revive the soldiers' hearts because I ever found them as myself. Undaunted spirit in a dying breast, then be it so. Heavens keep old Bedford safe. And now no more ado, brave Burgundy, but gather we our forces out of hand and set upon our boasting enemy. Whither away, Sir John Falstaff, in such haste? Whither away to save myself by flight? We're like to have the overthrow again. What? Will you fly and leave Lord Talbot? All oh, the Talbots in the world to save my life. Aye. Cowardly knight, ill fortune follow thee. Now... Quiet soul, depart when heaven's pleased, for I have seen our enemies o'erthrow. What is the truest 
trust or strength of foolish man. They that of late were daring with their scoffs are glad and fain by flight to save themselves. <laughs> Lost and recovered in a day again. This is a double honor, Burgundy. Yet heavens have glory for this victory. Warlike and martial Talbot, Burgundy enshrines thee in his heart and there erects thy noble deeds as valor's monuments. Oh, thanks, gentle Duke. But where is Pucelle now? Oh, I think her old familiar is asleep. Now where's the bastard's braves and Charles, his glikes? What? All a mort? Rouen hangs her head for grief that such a valiant company are fled. Now will we take some order in the town, placing therein some expert officers, and then depart to Paris to the king, for there young Henry with his nobles lie. What wills Lord Talbot pleaseth, Burgundy. Yet, but before you go, let's not forget the noble Duke of Bedford lay deceased, but see his exequies fulfilled in Rouen. A braver soldier never couched lance, a gentler heart did never sway in court, but kings and mightiest potentates must die, for that's the end of human misery. Dismay not, princes, at this accident, nor grieve that Rowan is so recovered. Care is no cure, but rather corrosive for things that are not to be remedied. Let frantic Talbot triumph for a while, and like a peacock sweep along his tail. We'll pull his plumes and take away his train if Dauphin and the rest will be ruled. We have been guided by thee hitherto. And of thy cunning had no dividends. One sudden foil shall never breed distrust. Search out thy wit for secret policies, and we will make thee famous through the world. We'll set thy statue in some holy place and have thee revered like a blessed saint. Employ thee then, sweet virgin, for our God. Then thus it must be. This doth Joan devise. By fair, fair persuasions mixed with sugared words, we will entice the Duke of Burgundy to leave the Talbot and to follow us. Ay, marry, sweeting, if we could do that. France were no place for Henry's warriors, nor should that nation boast it so with us, but be extirped from our provinces. Well, forever should they be expulsed from France and not have title of an earldom here. Your honors shall perceive how I will work to bring this matter to the wished end. Hark, by the sound of drum, you may perceive their powers are marching on to Paris Ward. There goes the Talbot with his colors spread and all the troops of English after him. Now in the rearward comes the Duke and his fortune in favor makes him lag behind. Summon a parley, we will talk with him. A parley with the Duke of Burgundy! Who craves a parley with the Burgundy? The princely Charles of France, thy countryman. What sayest thou, Charles, for I am marching thence? Speak, Pucelle, and enchant him with thy words. Brave Burgundy, undoubted hope of France, stay. Let thy humble handmaid speak to thee. Be gone. Be not, be not over tedious. Look on thy country. Look on fertile France and see the cities and the towns defaced by wasting ruin of the cruel foe. As looks the mother on her lowly babe when death doth close his tender dying eyes. See, see the pining malady of France. Behold the wounds the most unnatural wounds which thou thyself hast given her woeful breast. Turn the edged sword another way, strike those that hurt and hurt not those that help. One drop of blood drawn from thy country's bosom should grieve thee more than streams of foreign gore. Return thee therefore with a flood of tears and wash away thy country's stained spots. As she hath bewitched me with her words or nature makes me suddenly relent. Besides, all French and France exclaims on thee, doubting thy birth and lawful progency. 
who joinst thou with, but with a lordly nation that will not trust thee, but for profit's sake? When Talbot have set footing once in France and fashioned thee that instrument of ill, who then but English Henry will be lord, and thou will be thrust out like a fugitive? Call we to mind and mark but this for proof. Was not the Duke of Orleans thy foe? And was he not in England prisoner? But when they heard he was thine enemy, they set him free without his ransom paid, in spite of Burgundy and all his friends. See then, thou fightst against thy countrymen, and joints with them will be thy slaughtermen. Come, come, return, return, thou wandering lord. Charles and the rest will take thee in their arms. I am vanquished. These haughty words of hers have battered me like roaring cannon shot and made me almost yield upon my knees. Forgive me, country and sweet countrymen and, and lords, accept this hearty kind embrace. My forces and my power of men are yours. So farewell, Talbot, I no longer trust thee. Done like a Frenchman, turn and turn again. Welcome, brave duke, thy friendship makes us fresh. And do beget new courage in our breasts. <laughs> Poussel hath bravely played her part in this and doth deserve a coronet of gold. Now, let us on, my lords, and join our powers and seek how we may prejudice the foe. My gracious prince and honorable peers, Hearing of your arrival in this realm, I have a while given truce unto my wars to do my duty to my sovereign, and sign whereof this arm that hath reclaimed to your obedience fifty fortresses, twelve cities, and seven walled towns of strength, beside five hundred prisoners of esteem. Let's fall his sword before your highness' feet, and with his submissive loyalty of heart, ascribes the glory of his conquest got first to my God, and next unto your grace. Is this the Lord Talbot, Uncle Gloucester, that hath so long been resident in France? Yes, if it please your majesty, my liege. Welcome, brave captain and victorious lord. When I was young, as yet I am not old, <laughs> <laughs> I do remember how my father said, a stouter champion never handled sword long since we were resolved of your truth, your faithful service and your toil in war. Yet you have never tasted our reward or been regarded with so much as thanks because till now we never saw your face. Therefore stand up and for these good desserts, we here create you Earl of Shrewsbury and in our coronation, Take your place. Now, so, to you there was so at haunt and see disgracing of these colors I wear. In honor of my noble Lord of York, dost thou maintain the former words thou spakest? Yes, sir, as well you dare patronate the envious barking of your saucy tongue against my Lord, the Duke of Somerset. Sirrah, thy lord I honour as he is. Why, <laughs> what is he? As good a man as York. Hark ye not so with witness, take ye that. <gasps> Villain, thou knowest the law of arms is such that whoso draws a sword tis present death, or else this blow shall approach thy dearest blood. No, but I'll unto this majesty and crave I may have liberty to avenge this wrong. When thou shalt see, I'll meet thee to thy cost. Well, Miss Crint, I'll be there as you, after, and after meet you sooner than you would. Lord Bishop, set the crown upon his head. God save King Henry of that name, the sixth. Now, Governor of Paris, take your oath. That you elect no other king but him, esteem none friends but such are his friends, and none your foes but such shall be pretend malicious practices against his state. This ye do, 
So help you, righteous God. My gracious sovereign, as I rode from Gallus to haste unto your coronation, a letter was delivered to my hands, writ to your grace from the Duke of Burgundy. Shame to the Duke of Burgundy and thee! I vowed, base knight, when I did meet thee next to tear the garter from thy craven's leg, which I have done because unworthily thou wast installed in that high degree. Pardon me, princely Henry, and the rest. This dastard at the Battle of Poitiers, when but in all I was 6,000 strong, and that the French were almost 10 to 1 before we met, or that a stroke was given, like to a trusty squire did run away, in which assault we lost 1,200 men. Myself and diverse gentlemen beside were there surprised and taken prisoners. Then judge, great lords, if I have done amiss, or whether that such cowards ought to wear this ornament of knighthood, yea or no? To say the truth, this fact was infamous and ill-beseeming any common man, much more a knight, a captain, and a leader. When first this order was ordained, my lords, knights of the garter were of noble birth, valiant, and virtuous, full of haughty courage, such as were grown to credit by the wars, not fearing death, nor shrinking for distress, but always resolute in most extremes. He then, that is not furnished in this sort, doth but usurp the sacred name of knight, profaning this most honorable order, and should, if I were worthy to be judge, be quite degraded, like a hedge-born swain that doth presume to boast of gentle blood. Stain to thy countrymen, thou hearest thy doom. Be packing, therefore, thou that wast a knight. Henceforth we banish thee on pain of death. And now, my Lord Protector, view the letter sent from our uncle, Duke of Burgundy. What means his grace that he hath changed his style? No more but plain and bluntly to the king. Hath he forgot he is his sovereign? Or doth this churlish superscription pretend some alteration in goodwill? What's here? I have upon a special cause moved with compassion of my country's rack, together with the pitiful complaints of such as your oppression feeds upon, forsaken your pernicious faction and joined with Charles, the rightful King of France. Oh, monstrous treachery, can this be so? That in alliance, amity and oaths, there should be found such false dissembling guile? What, doth my uncle Burgundy revolt? He doth, my lord, and is become your foe. Is that the worst this letter doth contain? It is the worst, and all, my lord, he writes. Why, then, Lord Talbot there shall talk with him, and give him chastisement for this abuse. How say you, my lord? Are you not content? Content, my liege. Yes. But that I am prevented, I should have begged I might have been employed. Then gather strength and march unto him straight. Let him perceive how ill we brook this treason and what offense it is to flout his friends. I go, my lord, in heart desiring still, you may behold confusion of your foes. Grant me the combat, gracious sovereign. And me, my lord, grant me the combat too. Uh, this is my servant. Hear him, noble prince. And this is mine, sweet Henry. Favor him. Be patient, lords, and give them leave to speak. Say, gentlemen, what makes you thus exclaim? And, and wherefore crave you combat, or with whom? With him, my lord, for he hath done me wrong. I with him, for he hath done me wrong. What is this wrong whereof you both complain? First, let me know, and then I'll answer you. 
crossing the sea from England into France, this fellow, here with his envious coughing tongue, are berating me about the rose I wear, saying the sanguine color of their leaves did represent my master's blushing cheeks. When stubbornly he did repugn the truth about a tr certain question in the law, argued betwixt the Duke of York and him, with other vile and ignominious terms and confusion of the rude reproach and in defense of my lord's worthiness, I crave the benefit of the law of arms. And that is my petition, noble lord, for though he seen with forge quite conceit to see the gloss upon his bold intent, yet no, my lord, I was provoked by him and took exception with his badge, pronouncing the paleness of his flower, bereaved the faintness of my master's heart. Will not this malice Somerset be left? A private grudge, my lord of York, will out, though ne'er so cunningly you smother it. Good lord! What madness rules in brain-sick men, when for so slight and frivolous a cause such factious emulations shall arise, good cousins both of York and Somerset, quiet yourselves, I pray, and be at peace. Let this dissension first be tried by fight, and then your highness shall command a peace. The quarrel touches none but us alone. Betwixt ourselves, let us decide it then. There is my pledge, Somerset, accept it. Now let it rest when it began first. Confirm it so, mine honorable lord. Confirm it so? Confounded be your strife, and perish ye with your audacious prate. Presumptuous vassals, are you not ashamed with this immodest clamor and outrage to trouble and disturb the king and us? And you, my lords, methinks you do not well to bear with their perverse objections, much less to take a occasion from their mouths to raise a mutiny betwixt yourselves. Let me persuade you to take a better course. It grieves his highness, good my lord, be friends. Come hither, you that would be combatants. Henceforth, I charge you, as you love our favor, quite to forget this quarrel and the cause. And you, my lords, remember where we are, in France, amongst a fickle, wavering nation. If they perceive dissension in our looks and that within ourselves we disagree, how will their grudging stomachs be provoked to willful disobedience and rebel? Beside, what infamy will there arise when foreign princes shall be certified that for a toy, a thing, of no regard, King Henry's peers and chief nobility destroyed themselves and lost the realm of France. Oh, think upon the conquest of my father, my tender years, and let us not forego that for a trifle that was bought with blood, let me be umpire in this doubtful strife. I see no reason if I wear this rose that one should therefore be suspicious. I'm more inclined to Somerset than York. Both are my kinsmen and I love them both. And well, they may upbraid me with my crown because forsooth the King of Scots is crowned but your discretions better can persuade than I am able to instruct or teach. And therefore, as we hither came in peace, so let us continue peace and love. Cousin of York, we institute your grace to be our regent in these parts of France. And my good Lord Somerset, unite your troops of horsemen with his bands of foot and like true subjects, Sons of your progenitors, go cheerfully together and digest your angry collar on your enemies. Ourself, my Lord Protector and the rest, after some respite will return to Calais from thence to England, where I hope ere long to be presented by your victories with Charles Alençon and that traitorous rout. My Lord of York, 
I promise you the king prettily, me thought, did play the orator. So he did. But yet I like it not, in that he wears the badge of Somerset. Tosh, it was but his fancy. Blame him not. I dare presume, sweet prince, he thought no harm. And if I wist he did, but let it rest. Other affairs must now be managed. Well, didst thou, Richard, to suppress thy voice, for had the passions of thy heart burst out, I fear we should have seen deciphered there more rancorous spite, more furious raging broils than yet can be imagined or supposed. But howsoever, no simple man that sees this jarring discord of nobility, this shouldering of each other in the court, this factious bandying of their favorites, but that it doth presage some ill event. Tis much when scepters are in children's hands, but more when envy breeds unkind division. There comes the ruin, there begins confusion. Go to the gates of Bordeaux, trumpeter. Summon their general unto the wall. English, English John Talbot, captains, call you forth. Servant in arms to Harry, King of England, and thus he would. Open your city gates, be humble to us. Call my sovereign yours, and do him homage as obedient subjects and I'll withdraw me in my bloody power. But if you frown upon this proffered peace, you tempt the fury of my three attendants, lean famine, quartering steel, and climbing fire, who in a moment, even with the earth, shall lay your stately and air-braving towers if you forsake the offer of their love. Thou ominous and fearful owl of death, our nation's terror, and their bloody scourge. The period of thy tyranny approacheth. On us thou canst not enter but by death. For I protest, we are well fortified and strong enough to issue out and fight. If thou retire, the Dauphin well appointed stands with the snares of war to tangle thee. On either hand thee, there are squadrons pitched to wall thee from the liberty of flight, and no way canst thou turn thee for redress. But death doth front thee with apparent spoil, and pale destruction meets thee in the face. Ten thousand French have taken the sacrament to rive their dangerous artillery upon no Christian soul but English Talbot. Lo! There thou standst, a breathing, valiant man of an invincible, unconquered spirit. This is the latest glory of thy praise, that I, thy enemy, knew thee withal. For ere the glass that now begins to run, finish the process of his sandy hour, these eyes that see thee now well-colored, shall see thee withered, bloody, pale, and dead. Hark, hark, the dolphin's drum, a warning bell, sings heavy music to thy timorous soul, and mine shall ring thy dire departure out. He fables not, I hear the enemy. Out some light horsemen and peruse their wings. Oh, needless and negligent discipline. How are we parked and bounded in a pale? A little herd of England's timorous deer, mazed with a yelping kennel of French curs. If we be English deer, be then in blood, not rascal-like to fall down with a pinch, but rather moody mad. And desperate stags turn on the bloody hounds with heads of steel and make the cowards stand aloof at bay. Sell every man his life as dear as mine, and they shall find dear, dear of us, my friends. God and St. George, Talbot and England's right, 
prosper our colors in this dangerous fight. Are not the speedy scouts returned again that dogged the mighty army of the Dauphin? They are returned, my lord, and give it out that he has marched to Bordeaux with his power to fight with Talbot. As he marched along by your espials were discovered, two mightier troops than that that the Dauphin led, which joined with him and made their march for Bordeaux. Plague upon that villain Somerset that thus delays my promise and supply of horsemen that were levied for this siege. Now that Talbot doth expect my aid, and I am louted by a traitor villain and cannot help the noble Chevalier. God comfort him in this necessity. If he miscarry, farewell wars in France. The princely leader of our English strength, never so need for the earth of France, spurned to rescue the noble Talbot, who now is girdled to the waste of iron and hemmed about with grim destruction. To Bador, warlike duke, to Bador, York, else farewell, Talbot, France, and England's honor. Oh, God, that Somerset, who in proud heart doth stop my cornets, were in Talbot's place. So should we save a valiant gentleman by forfeiting a traitor and a coward. Mad ire and wrathful fury makes me weep that thus we die while Re Remus traitors sleep. Uh, send some to succor the distressed lord. He dies, we lose. I break my warlike word. We mourn, France smiles, we lose. They daily get all along of this vile traitor Somerset. Then God take mercy on the drave Talbot's soul and his young son John, who two hours since I met him travel towards his raw like father. Ugh. In seven years did not Talbot see his son, and now they meet where both their lives are done. Alas, what joy shall noble Talbot have to bid his young son welcome to his grave? Away! Vexation st almost stops my breath that sundered friends greet in the hour of death. Lucy, farewell. No more my fortune can, but curse the cause I cannot aid the man. Maine, Blois, Poitiers, and Tours are one away, long of, all long of Somerset and his delay. Thus, while the vulture of sedition feeds the bosom of great commanders, sleeping neglection both to trade the loss and the conquest of our sacred cold conqueror, that ever living man of memory, Henry V, Whilst each other cross lives, honors, lands, and all hurry to loss. It is too late. I cannot send them now. This expedition was by York and Talbot too rashly plotted. All our general force might with the sally of the very town be buckled with. The over-daring Talbot hath sullied all his gloss of former honor by this unheedful, desperate, and wild adventure York set him on to fight and die in shame that Talbot, dead, great York, might bear the name. Yes, uh, William Lucy with me set for our overmatched forces for, for aid. How now, Sir William, whither were you sent? Whither, my lord? From bought and sold Lord Talbot, who ringed about the bold adversary, cried out for noble York and Somerset to beat a sailing death from his weak legions, and this the honourable captain there drops bloody sweat from war wearied limbs and advantage lingering looks for rescue. You his false hopes, the trust of England's honour, keep off aloof the worthless emulation. Do not let your private discord keep away the levied succours that should lend him aid. Whilst he, renowned local gentleman, yield upon his life into a world of odds. All ends the bastard, Charles Burgundry, Allenson, Rainier, compass about him, and Talbot perisheth by a fault. York set him on. York should have sent him aid. And York, as fast upon your grace, exclaims, swearing that you withhold his debit host, collected for his expedition. York lies. He might have sent and had the horse. I owe him little duty and less love, and take foul scorn to fall on him by sending. The fraud of England is not the force of France. Hath now entrapped the noble-minded Talbot. Ne'er to England shall he bear his life, but dies. 
betrayed to fortune by your strife. Come, go. I will dispatch the horsemen straight. Within six hours they will be at his aid. Too late comes rescue. He is ta'en or slain, for fly he could not. For we would have fled, and fly would tell but never, though he might. If he be dead, brave Talbot, then adieu. His fame lives in the world, his shame in you. Oh, young John Talbot, I did send for thee to tutor thee in stratagems of war, that Talbot's name might be in thee revived when sapless age and weak, unable limbs should bring thy father to his drooping chair, but oh malignant and ill-boding stars. Now thou art come unto a feast of death, a terrible and unavoided danger. Therefore, dear boy, mount on my swiftest horse and I'll direct thee how thou shalt escape by sudden flight. Come, dally not, be gone. Is my name Talbot? And am I your son? And shall I fly? Oh, if you love our mother, dishonor not her noble name to make a, a bastard and a slave of me. The world will say, is not Talbot's blood that basely fled when noble Talbot stood? Fly to revenge my death if I be slain. He that flies will so uh, fly so will ne'er return again. If we both stay, we both are sure to die. Then let me stay. And father, do you fly? Your loss is great, so your regard should be my worth unknown. No loss is known to me. Upon my death, the French can little boast in yours. They will. In your, you, all hopes are lost. Flight cannot stain the honor you have won, but mine it will, that no exploit have done. Your, you fled for vantage, everyone will swear, but if I bow, you'll say it was for fear. There is no hope that ever I will stay if the first hour I shrink and run away. Here, on my knee, I beg mortality rather than life's preserved with infamy. Shall all thy mother's hopes lie in one tomb? Aye, rather than I'll shame my mother's womb. Upon my blessing, I command thee, go. To fight I will, but not to fly the foe. Part of thy father may be saved in thee. No part of him but will be shame in me. Thou never's had renown, nor canst not lose it. Yes, your renowned name shall flight abuse it. Thy father's charge shall clear thee from that stain. You cannot witness for me being slain. If death be so apparent, then both fly. And leave my followers here to fight and die? My age was never tainted with such shame. And shall my youth be guilty of such blame? No more can I be severed from your side than can yourself, yourself in twain defy. Stay, go, do what you will, the like I do. For live I will not if my father die. And here I take my leave of thee, fair son, born to eclipse thy life this afternoon. Come, side by side, together live and die, and soul with soul from France to heaven fly. St. George at victory, fight soldiers, fight! The regent hath with Talbot broke his word and left us to the rage of France his sword. Where is John Talbot? Pause and take thy breath. I gave thee life and rescued thee from death. Oh, twice, my father, twice am I thy son. The life thou gavest me first was lost and done till with thy warlike sword, despite of faith, thou to thou determined gave thou gavest new date. When from the Dauphin's crest thy sword struck fire, it warmed thy father's heart with proud desire of bold-faced victory. Then led in age, quickened with youthful spleen and warlike rage, beat down Alençon, Orleans, Burgundy, and from the pride of Gallia, rescued thee. The ireful bastard Orleans that drew blood from thee, my boy, and had the maidenhood of thy first fight, I soon encountered. And interchanging blows, I quickly shed some of his bastard blood, and in disgrace bespoke him thus, contaminated base, and misbegotten blood I spill of thine, mean and right poor for that pure blood of mine which thou didst force from Talbot, my brave boy. Here, purposing the bastard to destroy, came in strong rescue. Speak, 
thy father's care. Art thou not weary, John? How dost thou fare? Will, will thou yet leave the battle, boy, and fly? Now thou art sealed, the son of chivalry? Fly to revenge my death when I'm dead. The help of one stands me in little stead. Oh, too much folly is it. Well, I want to hazard all our lives in one small boat. If I today die, not with Frenchman's rage, tomorrow I shall die with mickle age. By me, they nothing gain. And if I stay, tis but the shortening of my life one day. In thee, thy mother dies. Our household's name, my death's revenge, thy youth and England's fame, all these and more we hazard by thy stay. All these are saved if thou wilt fly away. The sword of Orleans hath not made me smart. These words of yours draw life blood from my heart on that advantage brought with such a shame to save a paltry life and slay bright fame before young Talbot and old Talbot fly, the coward horse that bears me fall and die. And like me, to the peasant boys of France to be shamed scorn and subject of mischance? Surely, by all the glory you have won, and if I fly, I am not Talbot's son. Then talk no more of flight, it is no boot. If son to Talbot, die at Talbot's foot. Then follow thou, thy desperate sire of Crete, thou Icarus, thy life to me is sweet. If thou wilt fight, fight by thy father's side, and commendable proved, let's die in pride. Where is my other life? Oh, mine own is gone. Where's young Talbot? Where is valiant John? Triumphant death smeared with captivity, young Talbot's valor makes me smile at thee. When he perceived me shrink and on my knee, his bloody sword he brandished over me. And like a hungry lion did commence rough deeds of rage and stern impatience. But when my angry garden stood alone, tendering my ruin and assailed of none, dizzy eyed fury and great rage of heart, suddenly made him from my side to start into the clustering battle of the French. And in that sea of blood, my boy did drench his overmounting spirit. And there died my Icarus, my blossom in his pride. Oh, my dear Lord, lo, where your son is born. Thou antic death, which laughs us here to scorn, Anon from thy insulting tyranny, coupled in bonds of perpetuity, two Talbots winged through the lither sky, in thy despite shall scape mortality. Oh, oh, thou whose wounds become hard favored death, speak to thy father ere thou yield thy breath. Brave death by speaking, whether he will or no. Imagine him a Frenchman and thy foe. His poor boy, he smiles. He thinks as who should say, had death been French, then death had died today. Come, oh, come, lay him in his father's arms. My spirit can no longer bear these harms. Soldiers, adieu. I have what I would have. Now my old arms are young John Talbot's grave. Ah. Had York and Somerset brought rescue in, we should have found a bloody day of this. How oh, the young whelp of Talbot's raging wood did flesh his puny sword in Frenchman's blood. Once I encountered him, and thus I said, Thou maiden youth, be vanquished by a maid. 
but with a proud majestical high scorn he answered thus young talbot was not born to be the pillage of a giglet wench so rushing in the bowels of the french he left me proudly as unworthy fight uh, doubtless he would have made a noble knight see where he lies and hurst in the arms of the most bloody nurser of his harms hew them to pieces Pack their bones asunder, whose life was England's glory, Gallia's wonder. Oh no, forbear. For that which we have fled during the life, let us not wrong it dead. Herald, conduct me to the Dauphin's tent, who knows hath obtained the glory of the day. On what submissive message art thou sent? Submissive? Dauphin, it is mere French word. We English warriors wot not what it means. I come to know what prisoners thou hast ta'en to survey the bodies of the dead. For prisoners, askest thou? Hell, our prison is. But tell me whom thou seekst. But where is the great Alcides of the field, valiant Lord Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury, created for his rare success in arms? Gradle of Washford, Waterford, Valence, Lord Talbot of Goodrig Merchantfield, Lord Strange of Black Mare, Lord Verdon of Alton, Lord Cromwell Wingfield, Lord Thunville Sheffield, the thrice victorious Lord Vulcanbridge, Knight of the Altar of St. George, worthy St. Michael of the Golden Fleece, Great Marshal of Henry of the Thick, of all his war within the realm of France, here is a silly stately style indeed the turk that two and fifty kingdoms hath writes not so tedious a style as this him that thou magnifest with all these titles stinking and fly blown lies here at our feet is talbot slain the frenchman's only scrutiny your kingdom's terror and black nemesis Were my eyeballs burned into bullets turned, I rage may shoot them at your faces. Oh, but I will call that dead to life. I would fight the realm of France. But you was picture left among you here. It would have amazed the proudest of you all. Give me their bodies, that I might bear them hence and give them a burial as beseems their worth. I think this upstart is old Talbot's ghost. He speaks with such a proud, con commanding spirit. For God's sake, let him have them. To keep them here, they would but stink and putrefy the air. Go take their bodies hence. I'll bear them hence. But from their ashes shall be reared a phoenix that shall make all of France a Feared. So we be rid of them. Do with them what thou wilt. And now to Paris in this conquering vein. All will be ours, now bloody Talbot slain. Have you perused the letters from the Pope, the Emperor and the Earl of Armagnac? I have, my lord, and their intent is this. They humbly sue your excellence to have a godly peace concluded of the realms between England and of France. How doth your grace affect their motion? Well, my good Lord, and as the only means to stop effusion of our Christian blood and establish quietness on every side. I marry uncle, for I always thought it was both impious and unnatural that such Immanity and bloody strife should reign amongst professors of one's faith. Beside, my lord, the sooner to effect a surer bind this knot of amity, the Earl of Armagnac, near knit to Charles, a man of great authority in France, prefers his only daughter to your grace in marriage with a large and sumptuous dowry. <laughs> marriage, uncle. <laughs> Alas, my years are young. <laughs> And fitter is my study and my books than wanton dalliance with the paramour. Yet call the ambassador and as you please, so let them have their answers every one. I shall be well content with any choice, tends to God's glory and my country's weal. 
What, is my Lord of Winchester installed and called unto a cardinal's degree? Then I perceive that will be verified Henry V did sometime prophesy, if once he come to be a cardinal, he'll make his cap co-equal with the crown. My lords, ambassadors, your several suits have been considered and debated on, and therefore we are certainly resolved to draw conditions of a friendly peace, which by my Lord of Winchester we mean shall be transported presently to France. And for the proffer, my Lord, your master, I have informed his highness so at large as liking of the lady's virtuous gifts, her beauty and the value of her dower, he doth intend she shall be England's queen. In argument and proof of which contract bear her this jewel, pledge of my affection. And so my Lord Protector, see them guarded and safely brought to Dover, wherein shipped commit them to the fortune of the sea. Stay, my Lord Legate. You shall first receive the sum of money which I promised should be delivered to his holiness for clothing me in these grave ornaments. Now, Winchester will not submit, I trow, or be inferior to the proudest peer. Humphrey of Gloucester, thou shalt well perceive that neither in birth or for authority the bishop will be overborne by thee. I'll either make thee stoop and bend thy knee or sack this country with mutiny. These news, my lords, may cheer our drooping spirits to said the stout Parisians do revolt and turn again the war and turn again unto the warlike French. Then, then march to Paris, royal Charles of France, and keep not back your powers and dalliance. Peace be amongst them if they turn to us, else ruin combat with their palaces. Success unto our valiant general, and happiness to his accomplices. What tidings send our scout? I prithee, speak. The English army that divided was in two parties is now conjoined in one, and means to give you battle presently. Very cool. Somewhat too sudden, sirs, the warning is, but we will presently provide for them. <laughs> I trust the ghost of Talbot is not there. Now he is gone, my lord, you need not fear. If all base passions, fear is most accursed. Command the conquest, Charles, it shall be thine. Let Henry fret and all the world repine. Then on, my lords, and France, be fortunate! The regent conquers and the Frenchmen fly. Now, Help ye charming spells and periaps and ye choice spirits that admonish me and give me signs of future accidents. You speedy helpers that are substitutes under the lordly monarch of the North, appear and aid me in this enterprise. This speedy and quick appearance argues proof of your accustomed diligence to me now. Ye familiar spirits that are called out of the powerful regions under earth, help me this once that France may get the field. <sighs> Hold me not with silence over long. Where I was wont to feed you with my blood, I'll lop a member off and give it you in earnest of a further benefit so you do condescend to help me now. No hope to have redress. My body shall pay recompense if you will grant my suit. Cannot my body nor blood sacrifice entreat you to your wanted furtherance? Then take my soul, my body, soul, and all before that England give the French the foil. See, they forsake me. 
now the time is come that France must veil her lofty plumed crest and let her head fall into England's lap. My ancient incantations are too weak and hell too strong for me to buckle with. Now, France, thy glory droopeth to the dust. Damsel of France, I think I have you fast. Unchain your spirits now with spelling charms and try if they can gain your liberty. A goodly prize fit for the devil's grace. See how the ugly witch doth bend her brows as if with Circe she would change my shape. Change to a worser shape thou canst not be. Oh, Charles the Dauphin is a proper man. No shape but his can please your dainty eye. A plaguing mischief light on Charles and thee, and may ye both be suddenly surprised by bloody hands in sleeping on your beds. Fell banning hag, enchantress, hold thy tongue. I prithee give me leave to curse a while. Curse, miscreant, when thou comest to the stake. Be what thou wilt, thou art my prisoner. O oh, fairest beauty, do not fear nor fly, for I will not touch thee but with reverend hands. I kiss these fingers for eternal peace and lay them gently on thy tender side. Who art thou? Say that I might honor thee. Margaret, my name, and daughter to a king, the king of Naples, whosoever thou art. An earl I am and Suffolk am I called. Be not offended, nature's miracle, thou art allotted to be tamed by me. So doth the swan her downy signet save, keeping them prisoner underneath her wings. Yet, if this servile usage once offend, go and be free again as Suffolk's friend. Oh, stay. I have no power to let her pass. My hand would free her, but my heart says no. To place the sun upon the glassy streams, twinkling another counterfeited beam, so seems this gorgeous beauty to mine eyes. Fain would I woo her, yet I dare not speak. I'll call for pen and ink and write my mind. Fie, de la pole, disable not thyself, hast not a tongue, is she not here, but thou be daunted at a woman's sight. Why, beauty's princely majesty is such confounds the tongue and makes the senses rough. Say, Earl of Suffolk, if thy name be so, what ransom must I pay before I pass? For I perceive I am thy prisoner. How canst thou tell she will deny thy suit before thou make a trial of her love? Why speak'st thou not? What ransom must I pay? She's beautiful, and therefore to be wooed. She is a woman, and therefore to be won. Wilt thou accept of ransom, yea or no? Fond man, remember thou hast a wife. And how can Margaret be thy paramour? I were best to leave him, for he will not hear. There, all is marred. There lies a cooling card. He talks at random. Sure, the man is mad. And yet a dispensation may be had. And yet I would that you would answer me. I'll win this Lady Margaret. For whom? Or for my king? Tush! That's a wooden thing. If he talks of wood, it is some carpenter. Yet so my fancy may be satisfied and peace established between these realms. But there remains a scruple in that too. For though her father be the king of Naples, Duke of Anjou and Maine, Yet is he poor, and our nobility will scort the match. Hear ye, Captain. Are you not at leisure? It shall be so. Disdain they ne'er so much. Henry is youthful, and will quickly yield. Madam, I have a secret to reveal. What? Though I be enthralled, he seems a knight, and will not any way dishonor me. Lady vouchsafe to listen what I say. Perhaps I shall be rescued by the French, and then I need not crave his courtesy. Sweet madam, give me 
hearing in a cause. Women have been caught to bait ere now. Lady Fair, wherefore talk you so? I cry you mercy. Tis but quid for quo. Say, gentle princess, we do not suppose your bondage happy to be made a queen. To be a queen in bondage is more vile than is a slave in base servility, for princes should be free. And so shall you, if happy England's royal king be free. Why? What concerns his freedom unto me? I'll undertake to make thee Henry's queen, to put a golden scepter in thy hand, to set a precious crown upon thy head, if thou wilt condescend to be my... What? His love. I am unworthy to be Henry's wife. No, gentle madam. I unworthy am to woo so fair a dame to be his wife, and have no portion in the choice myself. How say you, madam? Are you so content? And if my father please, I am content. Then call our captains and our colors forth, and madam, at your father's castle walls, will crave a parley to confer with him. Oh, see, <laughs> see, Rainier, see thy daughter prisoner. To whom? To me. Oh, what remedy? I am a soldier and unapt to weep or to exclaim on fortune's fickleness. Yes, there is remedy enough, my lord. Consent, and for thy honor give consent. Thy daughter shall be wedded to my king, whom I with pain have wooed and won thereto. And this her easy held imprisonment hath gained thy daughter princely liberty. Speak Suffolk as he thinks. Fair Margaret knows that Suffolk doth not flatter face or feign. Upon thy princely warrant, I descend, I'll, I, to give the answer of thy just demand. And here I will expect thy coming. <laughs> oh, welcome, brave Earl, into our territories, command, and Anjou, what your honor pleases. <laughs> Thanks, Rainier. Happy for so sweet a child, fit to be a maid companion with a king. What answer makes your grace unto my suit? Since thou dost deign to woo her little worth to be the princely bride of such a lord, upon condition I may quietly enjoy mine own, the country, Maine, and Anjou, free from oppression or the stroke of war, my daughter shall be Henry's, if he please. That is her ransom. I deliver her, and those two counties I will undertake, your grace shall well and quietly enjoy. And I again in Henry's royal name as deputy unto that gracious king give thee her hand for sign of plighted faith. Rainier of France, I give thee kingly thanks because this is in traffic of a king. And yet methinks I could be well content to be mine own attorney in this case. I'll over then to England with this news and make this marriage to be solemnized. So farewell, Rainier. Set this diamond safe in golden palaces as it becomes. I do embrace thee as I would embrace the Christian Prince King Henry were he here. Farewell, my lord. Good wishes, praise, and prayers shall Suffolk ever have of Margaret. Farewell, sweet madam. But hark you, Margaret. No princely commendations to my king. Such commendations as becomes a maid, a virgin, and his servant say to him. Words sweetly placed and modestly directed. But madam, I must trouble you again. No loving token to his majesty. Yes, my good lord. A pure, unspotted heart, never yet taint with love, I send the king. And this withal. That for thyself. I will not so presume to send such peevish tokens to a king. Oh, wert thou for myself. 
at Suffolk. Stay. Thou mayst not wander in that labyrinth. There minotaurs and ugly treasons lurk. Solicit Henry with her wondrous praise. Bethink thee on her virtues that surmount and natural graces that extinguish art. Repeat their semblance often on the seas. When thou comest to kneel at Henry's feet, thou mayst bereave him of his wits with wonder. Bring forth that sorceress condemned to burn. Ah, Joan, this kills thy father's heart outright. Have I sought every country far and near, and now is, it, is my chance to find thee out? Must I behold thy timeless, cruel death? Ah, Joan, sweet daughter Joan, I'll die with thee. Decrepit miser, base, ignoble wretch. I am descended of a gentler blood. Thou art no father nor no friend of mine. Out, out, my lords, and please you, tis not so. I did beget her. All the parish knows. Her mother liveth yet, can testify she was the first fruit of my bachelorship. Graceless, wilt thou deny thy patronage, parentage? This argues what her life, kind of life, hath been, wicked and vile, and so her death concludes. Fie, Joan, that thou wilt be obstacle. God knows thou art a collop of my flesh, and for thy sake have I shed many a tear. Deny me not, I prithee, good gentle Joan. Peasant avaunt, you have suborned this man of purpose to obscure my noble birth. Tis true. I gave a noble to the priest the morn that I was wedded to her mother. Kneel down and take my blessing, good my girl. Wilt thou not stoop? Now cursed be the time of thy nativity. I would the milk thy mother gave thee when thou suckst her breast had been a little rat's bane for thy sake. Or else when thou didst keep my lambs afield, I, I wish some ravenous wolf had eaten thee. Dost thou deny thy father, cursed drab? Oh, burn her. Burn her. Hanging is too good for her. Take her away, for she hath lived too long to fill the world with vicious qualities. First, let me tell you whom you have condemned. Not me, begotten of a shepherd swain, but issued from the progeny of kings. Virtuous and holy chosen from above by inspiration of celestial grace to work exceeding miracles on earth. I never had to do with wicked spirits, but you that are polluted with your lusts, stained with the guiltless blood of innocence, corrupt and tainted with a thousand vices because you want the grace that others have. You judge it straight, a thing impossible to compass wonders, but by help of devils. No, misconceived. Joan of Air hath been a virgin from her tender infancy, chaste and immaculate in very thought, whose maiden blood thus rigorously effused will cry for vengeance at the gates of heaven. Aye, aye, away with her to execution. And hark ye, sirs, because she is a babe, spare for no faggots, let there be an owl. Place barrels of pitch upon the fatal stake, that so her torture may be shortened. Will nothing turn your unrelenting hearts? Then, Joan, discover thine infirmity that warranteth by law to be thy privilege. I am with child, ye bloody homicides, murder not then the fruit within my womb, although ye hail me to a violent death. Now, heaven forfend, the holy maid with child? The greatest miracle that e'er ye wrought. Is that all your strict preciseness come to this? Oh, she and the Dauphin have been juggling. I did imagine what that would, what would be a refuge. <laughs> well, go to. We'll have no bastards live, especially since Charles must father it. You are deceived. My child is none of his. It was oh. Alanson that enjoyed my love. 
Oh, Alanson, that notorious Machiavel. It dies, and if it had a thousand lives. <laughs> Give me leave, I have deluded you. Twas oh, neither Charles nor yet the Duke I named, but Rainier, King of Naples that prevailed. A married man, that's most intolerable. Why, here's a girl. I think she knows not well. There were so many whom she may accuse. <laughs> it's a sign she hath been liberal and free. And yet, <laughs> forsooth, she is a virgin pure. Oh. Strumpet, thy words condemn thy brat and thee. Use no entreaty, for it is in vain. Then lead me hence, with whom I leave my curse. May never glorious sun reflects his beams upon the country where you make abode, but darkness and the gloomy shade of death environ you, till mischief and despair drive you to break your necks or hang yourselves. Break thou in pieces and consume to ashes, thou foul accursed minister of hell! Lord Regent, I do greet your excellence with letters of commission from the king. For know, my lords, the states of Christendom, moved with remorse of these outrageous broils, have earnestly implored a general peace betwixt our nation and the aspiring French. And here at hand, the Dauphin and his train approacheth to confer about some matter. All our travail turned to this effect. After the slaughter of so many peers, so many captains, gentlemen, and soldiers that in this quarrel have been overthrown and sold their bodies for their country's benefit, shall we at last conclude effeminate peace? Have we not lost most part of all the towns by treason, falsehood, and by treachery our great progenitors had conquered? Oh, Warwick, Warwick, I foresee with grief the utter loss of all the realm of France. Be patient, York. If we conclude a peace, it shall be with such, such strict and severe covenants as little shall the Frenchman gain thereby. Since, <clears throat> lords of England, it is thus agreed that peaceful truce shall be proclaimed in France, we come to be informed by yourselves what the conditions of that league must be. Speak, Winchester, for boiling choler chokes the hollow passage of my poisoned voice by sight of these our baleful enemies. Charles and the rest, it is enacted thus, that in regard King Henry gives consent of mere compassion and of lenity to ease your country of distressful war and suffer you to breathe in fruitful peace. You shall become true liegemen to his crown, and Charles, upon condition thou wilt swear to pay him tribute and submit thyself, thou shalt be placed as viceroy under him and still enjoy thy regal dignity. Must he be then a shadow of himself? Adorn his temples with a coronet, and yet in substance and authority retain but privilege of a, a private man. This proffer is absurd and reasonless. Tis known already that I am possessed with more than half the Gallian territories, and therein reverenced for their lawful king. Shall I, for Luca of the rest, unvanquished, detract so much from that prerogative as to be called but viceroy of the whole? No, Lord Ambassador, I'll rather keep that which I have than coveting for more be cast from possibility of all. Insulting Charles, hast thou by secret means used intercession to obtain a league and now the matter grows to compromise, stands thou aloof upon comparison? Either accept the title thou usurp'st or benefit proceeding from our king and not of any challenge of desert or we will plague thee with incessant wars. My lord, you do not well in obstinacy to cavil in the course of this contract. If once it be neglected, ten to one we shall not find like opportunity. To say truth, <clears throat> it is 
your policy to save your subject from such massacre and ruthless slaughters as are daily seen by our proceeding in hostility, and therefore take this compact of a truce, although you break it when your pleasure serves. How say so, Charles? Shall our condition stand? It shall. Only reserved, you claim no interest in any of our towns of garrison. Then swear allegiance to his majesty, as thou art knight, never to disobey nor be rebellious to the crown of England, thou nor thy nobles to the crown of England. So now dismiss your army when ye please. Hang up your ensigns, let your drums be still. For here we entertain a solemn peace. Your wondrous, rare, rare description, noble Earl, of beauteous Margaret hath astonished me. Her virtues graced with eternal gifts do breed love settled passions in my heart. And like the rigor of tempestuous Gusts provokes the mightiest hulk against the tide. So am I driven by breath of her renown, either to suffer shipwreck or arrive where I may have fruition of her love. Hush, my good Lord, this superficial tale is but a preface of her worthy praise. The chief perfections of that lovely dame had I sufficient skill to utter them, would make a volume of enticing lines able to ravish any dull conceit. And, which is more, she is not so divine, so full replete with choice of all delights, but with a humble lowliness of mind, she is content to be at your command. A command, I mean, of virtuous, chaste intents to love and honor Henry as her lord. And otherwise will Henry ne'er presume Therefore, my lord protector, give consent that Margaret may be England's royal queen. So should I give consent to flatter sin? You know, my lord, your highness is betrothed unto another lady of esteem. How shall we then dispense with that contract and not deface your honor with reproach? As doth a ruler with unlawful oaths, or one that at a triumph, having vowed to try his strength, or forsaketh, yet the lists by reason of his adversary's odds. A poor earl's daughter is unequal odds, and therefore may be broke without offense. Why, what I pray is Margaret more than that. Her father is no better than an earl, although in glorious titles he excel. Yes, my lord, her father is a king the king of Naples and Jerusalem, and of such great authority in France as his alliance will confirm our peace and keep the Frenchmen in allegiance. And so the Earl of Armagnac may do, because he is near kinsman unto Charles. Beside his wealth doth warrant a liberal dower, where Rainier sooner will receive than give. A dower, my lords. Disgrace not so your king that he should be so abject, base, and poor to choose for wealth and not for perfect love. Henry is able to enrich his queen and not to seek a queen to make him rich. So worthless peasants bargain for their wives as market men for oxen, sheep, or horse. Marriage is a matter of more worth than to be dealt in by attorneyship. Not whom we will, but whom his grace affects, must be companion of his nuptial bed. And therefore, Lord, since he affects her most, most of all these reasons bind us, uh, bindeth us, in our opinions she should be preferred. For what is wedlock forced but a hell, an age of discord and continual strife, whereas the contrary bringeth bliss and is a pattern of celestial peace? Whom should we match with Henry, being king, but Margaret, that is daughter, to a king? Hmm? Her peerless feature, joined with her birth, approves her fit for none but for a king. Her valiant courage and undaunted spirit, more than in women commonly is seen, will answer our hope in issue of a king. 
for Henry, son unto a conqueror, is likely to beget more conquerors, if with a lady of so high resolve as is fair Margaret, he be linked in love. Then yield, my lords, and here conclude with me that Margaret shall be queen and none but she. Whether it be through force of your report, my noble, noble Lord of Suffolk, or for that my tender youth was never yet attained with any passion of inflaming love, I cannot tell. But this I am assured. I feel such sharp dissension in my breast, such fierce alarms both of hope and fear, and I am sick with working of my thoughts. Therefore, take shipping post, my lord, to France. Agree to any covenants and procure that Lady Margaret do vouchsafe to come to cross the seas to England and be crowned King Henry's faithful and anointed queen for your expenses and sufficient charge among the people. Gather up a tenth. Be gone, I say, for till you do return, I rest perplexed with a thousand cares. <laughs> and you, good uncle, banish all offense. If you do censure me by what you were, not what you are, I know it will excuse this sudden execution of my will. And so conduct me where? From company. And they revolve and ruminate my grief. Aye. Grief, I fear me, both first and last. Thus Suffolk have prevailed. And thus he <laughs> wrote as did the youthful Paris once to Greece with hope to find the like event in love. But prosper better than the Trojan did. Margaret shall now be queen and rule the king. But I will rule both her the king and realm. All right, everybody, come on back. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this first chapter of the first Henry ad. We will be back next week to continue the story. Feels like one of those old serials uh, with uh, part two of King Henry VI. We'll see you then.